Hello guys, I would like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. In this week's lesson, the pastor will share with you from the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, verses 6 through 8, verses 12 through 13, and verse 15. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you like to donate to our new Bethel Baptist Church Ministries, you can donate any amount to P.O. Box 18661, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and zip code 39404. God bless you guys, and enjoy the lesson. Hi, I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday School lesson for December the 26th, 2021 is Justice and Deliverance. Our Bible scriptures today are taken from Nahum, the first chapter, verses 1 through 3, verses 6 through 8, and verses 12 and 13, and verse 15. And we're still in this quarterly theme of justice, law, history. And our unit of study that we're in for this month is God requires justice. He requires justice. He requires us to be just or uh, be right in our decision-making, right in our treatment of others. He de desires, he requires us to be just. He also requires justice and judgment on his behalf, and those things will happen. And the people in that we are studying about in the Old Testament, they did go against the, the righteousness and justice of God, and they had to pay high penalties for it. And they it wasn't really it wasn't the keeping of the law. We know that. We went through that when we first started th this section out. Because by the keeping of the law, the scripture tells us the apostle Paul said, Shall no flesh be justified. We won't be justified like that. But to be just, to treat someone right, we can all do that. Our Bible scriptures are taken taken from Nahum, the first chapter, and Nahum is kind of a, a sequel, if you would, to Jonah. 150 years before Nahum writes this, before the, this kingdom, the Assyrian kingdom, these people of Nineveh were Assyrians, before it was taken down, Jonah had gone into Nineveh and walked a good piece into that city. It was a great city. It was a big city. The archaeological findings found that it was probably the biggest of the cities in the ancient times. And Jonah walked part way into that city and began to preach the gospel, preach that God in 40 days was going to wipe them out if they didn't repent, uh, repent of their wicked ways, turn to God himself. And the people did repent much to Jonah's dismay, even though he knew that if he preached, there was this, op this possibility that they would turn to God, and they did turn to God. But now, 150 years later, they had turned their back on God, and they had gone back to their old ways of killing and hurting and brutally attacking God's people. God actually used them in 722 to, to take his people down there in the Northern Territory because of their disobedience, because they had no good kings and, and they were just disobedient people. So the Northern Territory, or Israel, was taken apart and taken down by the Assyrians in 722 BC. But now these people were threatening to take the, the Southern Territory and Sennacherib and the guys were going to take them out even during the days of Hezekiah and God took out 185,000 of their soldiers one night with an angel and they had to understand that God was the most powerful and he was, he was all powerful. But Jonah went in there and he preached that message and the people did turn to God. But after they, after that turning to God, time happened. Just as we see the people of Israel, the reason for the book of Judges or the, all of the Judges was because the Judges would come in and the people would be delivered or saved from something they had done wrong and God would come in and save them from that, that person or that strong hand or that oppression that some enemy was putting on them 
And as soon as that judge was off the scene, the people would turn back, right back that, back to their idolatry and their mistreatment of others. And, and then God would have to, God would send in a punishment or a rod of correction and, and put that on them again. And they would have to turn back to God. He would send them another judge or another deliverer. And it would just go on and on from that. It would happen today if we didn't have the ultimate deliverer. If deep we didn't have one that saved us from our sins totally and completely that died. And when he died there on the cross, he proclaimed that it is finished before he died. If there was something else that needed to be done, he wouldn't have died yet. He would have stayed alive. But there, there he took care of every one of our sin debts in full, all of our idolatry, all of our turning back, all of our walking away. He took care of all of that. And when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, even though we may lose our mind one day and start seeming to worship something else, God has us in his hand and no man, Jesus proclaimed himself, can pluck us out. And, and so with, this, is, this is justice and deliverance that we're talking about today. Deliverance is salvation or liberation. Salvation is saved from that particular thing or as we are through Jesus Christ, saved from the punishment of, of sin, the penalty of sin, and even going to be saved from the presence of sin one day. We're, we're going to be totally saved, <clears throat> liberated also. We're going to be, but when we accept Jesus Christ, those whom the Son set free, the scripture says, are free indeed. We are, I know that in the, the political world, they would call a person that seems to be kind of loosey-goosey, a person that is liberal. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about the, way the, the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So I don't care if you call me a liberal. That, that I, there is liberty wherever the spirit of the Lord is. And I guarantee you he is with me. And if you're saved, he's definitely with you also. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So justice and salvation and liberation are deliverance as we would look at this. God requires justice. So we start out here as Jonah had preached 150 years ago, now we're 150 years into this and this kingdom, this Nineveh would fall in 612 BC and the Assyrians themselves would totally be wiped out. Even their names would be forgotten from the people of that time in 609 BC. So now just a few years later, it, it, they'd just be totally wiped out. So here, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. Nahum, the Elkishite. We don't know much about him other than the Elkishite. We could go into the speculation and, and we do know that, the, that Capernaum there by the Sea of Galilee is actually Capernaum, and it, which means the home of Nahum. But we don't know if it's this Nahum. Um, so we don't know that for sure. And others have, have put him in different places Maybe he was probably from around Judah and that's where Elkosh was, but we don't know that for sure either because the Bible doesn't tell us. This man doesn't tell us anything about him. He came on the scene to preach and teach a message and that's what he, he, he started doing. He had a message, he had a message and it was a message and it seemed to be of, of gloom and doom or destruction and devastation would come upon these people. The burden. The burden there is is a prophecy of doom. There are a prophecy that which means the burden means heaviness or something that is weighing a person down. This is going to be heavy upon the people of Nineveh. These people that at one time turned to God, but now 150 years later have turned their backs on God and gone back to their wicked ways of killing people, of uh, of putting people literally alive on a pole and letting that poles slide down through their body as the weight of their body would take them down, skinning people alive. They were a brutal people. There was no one more brutal than the people of, of Assyria, that burning children and, and all of these things. They were really bad people. But that's this city that uh, Nineveh, this is where the Assyrians were. 
the book of the vision. The vision, the word vision is revelation, something that is that is uh, a divine or supernaturally disclosed. Just so it was it was covered at one time, but now there is a revealing. Now you can see it. The re re revelation of this told by a person. Uh, prophet at this time, someone that speaks on behalf of God. Nahum is a prophet. We don't get much other than these three chapters from him, but he does say some things that go over and we can find some of the things in the New Testament, although he's not quoted much in the New Testament, but you can find some of the sayings there definitely. That Nahum, well, he's not quoted specifically in the New Testament. Nahum, the Elkishite, this, this man, his, his name means compassion or comforter. Uh, I think one of the, the translators said that his name can mean repenting. Well, whichever word it is, we know that it is a comforter or a compassionate type person, but it just doesn't seem right that he would be a person of compassion, yet he preached doom and gloom all the time and de destruction and devastation. But in the midst of destruction and devastation and the doom and gloom, we'll see the hand of compassion of God come through as this man would speak on behalf of God. The first, second verse says, God is jealous. The Lord venge, uh, revenges and the Lord revenges. The, it says that again. And is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He reserveth wrath for his enemy. God is jealous. Now, when we say we're jealous of somebody, we're, we're jealous of, of those that we love and we care about. And, and, and it seems that they're turning their backs on us some type of way. And we, we're, we're jealous and it, it, it makes our hearts feel bad. And, and we can even become angry because of that particular situation. But when the scripture says that God is jealous, because jealous can be bad on one end for, for a person, for, for the human being, but God is jealous. He's jealous because he loves us. He's jealous because he knows what this thing or those people are going to do to us. And that's why he's jealous uh, uh, about us, because of us. It, it, he doesn't want anything to hurt us. He's not worried about whether we're going we're gonna to keep loving him. God is love. That is who he is. He, he's already loved. So he is jealous and the Lord revenges or avenges is, is, is what the scripture is really talking about there. He avenges the, and it's, it's doubly stated there to, to get uh, the text of what's going on. Understand how powerful this is that God will revenge. He will revenge and is furious. He's furious. Now, he's not furious in the way that we get furious. He's, he's concerned about how his children are being treated. We just talked about that. And when we talked about the word jealous, because the word jealous could actually be, be, be put in as zeal or a strong desire or commitment. The Lord is committed to us, even though we're not committed to him. And you say, well, wait a minute. Why, how do you think that if, if he, if he's jealous, how can he, he be, be that committed for the chapter Third chapter of the gospel according to St. John, 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. He gave his child to die for our sin debt, substitutionarily on our behalf for our sins. So why wouldn't he be furious when someone tries to take us out? Someone tries to hurt us. Someone tries to turn us back away from him. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He will take vengeance. It, uh, uh, revenge is to exact punishment. He will punish those that are his ad adversaries. He reserveth wrath for his enemies. He the vengeance. He said, I will repay, saith the Lord there in the Romans, the 12th chapter, the 19th verse, vengeance are mine. I will repay. Fury is a, is a violent passion or rage. Now we don't see God out of control is is not an out of control passion. It is a violent passion of when, and we'll get on into this as in the next verse. But 
He can speak words that will help you to know how he feels about what's going on in that situation. So revenge is to act the exact punishment. So the revenge or the or avenging is taking care of or looking out. This is how his people were treated. He had allowed the Assyrians to chastise his people in the Northern Territory, even take them down in 722 BC. And now they're trying to take apart Judah. And he said, you can't do that. He promised Hezekiah that that won't happen. That's when he killed 185,000 soldiers. So now he is going to exact punishment on these brutal people there in the, the Assyrians. So he will show this fury, this violent passion or rage. Verse three says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Wow, what a mighty God. So the Lord is slow to anger and he is, he is slow to anger on our behalf and on the enemy's behalf. God could have taken them out the first time but he sent Jonah into this, this group of people there in, uh, in Nineveh, and he let him preach a message that was a, it seemed like a harsh message, but it was a message of hope to the people. Because when he said, if you don't repent in 40 days, he said, I'm giving you a chance. You have an opportunity. There is a stretch of time. There is a, a period of time, something you can definitely look at. You have this much time to turn to the Lord. So that was a message of hope that Jonah gave him. But this is a, most, a message of doom, gloom, destruction and devastation that comes out here as Nahum talks to the people. It says the Lord is slow to anger or slow to, to get to this, this wrath. In other words, God is a patient God. He is long suffering to us, what Peter said, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So here he's, he's patient. He is a patient God. He gives us time, chance after chance to, to turn to him, to come back to him, to look to him and, and understand him. Now, if a person is a believer, I'm not trying to tell you that because if they're a believer, then they have to punish they they have the punishment of sin or the consequences of sin if they they don't turn to the Lord. But Jesus has taken care of their sin dead in, in full. The the asking for, for forgiveness is for fellowship, not for, for relationship. You already have that. I, I could I could have got mad at my dad, my earthly father. And and he could have went to, to the South Pole and I could have went to the North Pole. But one thing is for sure, he was still my father. He was still my dad. DNA would approve that. So God has linked himself to us through the blood of his son. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and there is no way that you can separate that and thank God for that because we might, as we forestated, might lose our mind and say something that's out of the will of God. So he is slow to, to this anger. In other words, he's patient with us. And he's great in power. God is great in strength, even though it seems that he is slack concerning us or, or the things that we do. He is great in power and strength. He, at the right time, he will show his power and strength over our enemies. He will avenge us. He will be vengeful and he will repay. And when he repays, it will be a repayment in love. And he, maybe he won't repay. Maybe that person will turn to the Lord. You and I would have hurt them or killed them or taken them out. And the Lord had his hand on them to save them before it's everlasting too late. And we'd be walking around in heaven as brothers and sisters. But if you had killed them, then it would have been, been another way. So he said, vengeance of mine. He said, I will repay. And if that person turns to the Lord, the, the, the payment for their debt, for their sin, for their wrongdoing was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. Great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Those that don't turn to him, those that won't have him be a part of their life. We will not have this man to rule over us, what seemed to be the thought of the Pharisees and scribes. And because of that, 
Jesus spoke woes unto them. So he says he will not acquit the wicked. To, to acquit them is to relieve them from the fault, the faults of the oppression and, and abuse that they had poured out on the people of God or on people in general because they weren't just angry. They were equal, equal opportunity. They weren't just, just taking out people of God or the, or the children of Israel. They were taking out anybody that they came up against, anybody that wasn't, a, uh, wasn't an Assyrian. So the, he said he would he won't acquit the the wicked the, these people that that oppressed others and and abused others he said I, I won't and the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the cloud and the clouds are, are dust of his feet so all of creation he has at his disposal when that person has done wrong nothing can stop him from using whatever he wants to to punish that person. I mean, he used the Assyrians to punish the people in the Northern Territory. He will use the Babylonians to take out the Assyrians as well as take the people in the Southern Territory into, into captivity. So he uses whatever he wants to. He can send a tornado. He can send a hurricane. He can do send fires. He can do whatever he wants to because it's all at his disposal. The clouds are dust, are the dust of his feet. Everything that, that, that he wants to use, he can use it. Verse 6 says, moving on from verse 3 down to verse 6, it says, who can stand before the indignation, before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Who can stand before his indignation, his righteous anger, his righteous wrath? Who can stand when God is angry, standing in his righteous anger? Because all he has to do is speak and it'll, it'll be taken care of. And, and his, his, his indignation, his, his strong displeasure at something that is considered unjust, or an offense, or something that is insulting to his people. These things that have oppressed and abused his people. When he is standing there righteously indignant, who can stand against him? Who can stand up to him? No one can is the thought. This is a rhetorical type question. And, is, and it keeps on being rhetorical when it says, who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? who can stand there in the midst of this storm that he's sending through, this tornado, this whirlwind, this hurricane, who can stand there in the midst of that and, and, and look God in the eye and, as if they're not, it's not going to move them out of the way or take them out. His fury is poured out like fire. His fury, it comes down like a fire coming down and sweeping down a hill. I lived in the country, and when the hills caught on fire, it was something that you couldn't contain. My brother and I were playing with matches one day and lit some of the brush out in the woods and, and, and came back up, up the hill, and Dad said, y'all started a fire down there, didn't you? We, we, we were both looking at each other, getting ready to tell a lie, but we looked behind us, and the fire was just about up on us. It, it, that's how fast it, his, his fury is poured out. Like fire, like, like a fire, fire burns. It is to, dis, to, to destroy and the rocks are thrown down by him. The mountains, in other words, are, they just crumble to dust because he speaks his word. And, and even when he speaks, the intensity will, will take it down, will burn it down. His, the God's anger burns intensely against the wicked people of Assyria or Nineveh in this case. Verse 7 says, it is a wonderful verse, said, stated many times in the scripture. Sometimes say Lord, sometimes say God. But here it says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trusteth, trust in him. Now, God is good. The Lord is good. Asaph said in, in the 73rd number of Psalms that, God is good. Truly, God is good to Israel. But he said, my feet are well nigh slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He saw that. But in the 17th verse, he saw their end. And he knew that God was awesome. He said, until I walked into the sanctuary and I understood the end of those that seemed to just 
the, the prosperity of the wicked. I saw the end of them. So the Lord is good. He is good and, and a wonderful God to us. Psalms 107, first verse. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endure forever. Mercy there is compassion. In other words, his compassion is just, it, Jeremiah said is new every day. So he, he, he bakes up some more compassion, some more mercy for us every day. He looks at us in a merciful type way. It, and how long does it endure? It endures for he, forever. In other words, when you and I get to heaven, God won't be looking at us saying, I remember the day that you messed up. Now, he, he won't be looking at us that way because his mercy endures throughout eternity, forever is throughout eternity. The second verse of that Psalms 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. These people were being redeemed from the hand of the enemy, a stronghold in the day of trouble. They were in a time of trouble, but truly the Lord is good. He is good. He, and he's going to take care of them. A stronghold in a day of trouble, a fortified place. In other words, a rock or a shelter, a rock where, uh, that, that have us sheltered. The, shel the rock is Jesus Christ himself and nothing can penetrate that rock because he, he's too strong. He's, he's held by his father, God, and he knoweth them that trust him. Don't worry. God is not wondering who has faith in him. He's not wondering. He's not worried about it. He knows who trusts him. And that person that trusts him, according to the to Hebrews 11 and 6, that person that trusts him pleases God. God is pleased with that person. And that person looking and say, wait a minute, I've made so many mistakes after I got saved, but you trust him. It was because Abraham believed God that it was counted unto him for righteous. God was pleased with him, and he's pleased with you if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's not wondering if you trust him. He knows that you trust him, and he knows that you're going to have hiccups and hangups. Ask David and ask Abraham, people that, that really trusted God. Ask Samson, people that are in the faith, in the uh, the hall of faith there in the 11th chapter of of. of uh, Hebrews. So we, we look at this and there are some that have made mistakes, but they trusted God and they pleased God because they did trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Here we go with something that was taking in and helped to understand by the historians of days gone by. But an overrunning flood will he make an utter end of the place thereof. The place thereof was Nineveh. Nineveh had walls of, the, of its city that were so wide that chariots rode around the walls. They had so many lookout towers to it's hard to, to add up and, and count. The, from, from there, they could throw boulders down on the enemy that was coming at them. But because we just read that God is in control of the very nature also and creation, there came through a flood that according to the, 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 the historian of, of the Greeks back in fifth century that recorded that the Babylonians army was able to invade Nineveh. When the Tigris River overflowed and washed away the floodgates and the huge city and its foundation of the palace, all taken down so Babylon was able to come in and wipe these people out because they had an impenetrable city according to the flesh, but they didn't have anything to stop them from God from invading their city. He could come straight in. Jonah walked in because God told him to, but this, when God wanted to take the city down, he just broke down those walls, those massive walls that had everyone shut out. But an, with an overflowing flood, he will make the utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. The enemies. Darkness seems to be quite a scary thing. When a person is cast out into outer darkness, Jesus talked about. It cast into outer darkness. Uh, uh, it's a place of, I've been down into the, the taverns in, in, in mountains before. And they had light in there that man had put in there, but when they switched the light off and you were under all those feet of rock, hundreds of feet of rock, 
it felt eerie, very eerie. But a person that is in outer darkness, away from God, God is there, but you don't feel him there and you don't even understand that he's there when you're there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. But still here, a person that is out in outer darkness, those those are the enemies of God. Darkness shall pursue his enemies. That'll be their place in standing. Verse 12 says, thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. God is saying here, thus saith the Lord himself. He said, you have a sense of safety. Quietness there is, is you have a sense of safety. Things have been really nice for you guys. You had these great, wonderful walls around your city. No one could penetrate your walls. No one could come in unless you allowed them in. And, and Jonah came in 120 years ago, but now that uh, 150 years ago, but now that, that time is gone and you've turned your back on God. Now you seem to have this sense of safety again. You're able to do whatever you want to do and mistreat people the way that you have been in, in times before. You even have allies, people that are walking with you in this. And likewise, many is what was said there about that. But they won't stand. None of you will stand. Yet they shall be cut down. Cut down their means. They will be destroyed. Every one of you along with them, all of the allies, all of those that are Syrians that are away from this place, away from Nineveh, they'll be cut down too in 609 BC also when God walks through. When God passes through, when he comes through, no one will be able to stop. That the, the that will bring the storm. That'll bring the flood. It'll wash away the walls. All those things that you thought were impenetrable, he will take them down. Though I have afflicted thee, God says. He's talking to the children of Israel. I, though I have, I have afflicted you, though I, I've let these people come in as my rod of correction, I won't afflict you anymore with these guys. They won't come in and afflict you anymore. I won't punish you using these people anymore. The reason he won't do that is because they'll be wiped out. He's going to totally wipe them out. Then he says this in verse 13. For I will break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. You have, you have this yoke that has been around you, this, this agency of oppression the, uh, the, and uh, subjection and servitude, this thing that have you just like the oxen, the person that is in control of the reins that are, that have, that are through the yoke, they keep the oxen and make the oxen go where they want to go. When we put a yoke on our goats because they jumped the fence, they were in, under a burden. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. God told these people, he said, I will break the yokes off of you. They, I'm going to break them off. He said, I will burst our bonds. In other words, the restraints that have you bound down. I'll take care of the bonds, the restraints and the chains, those things. I'll break them, uh, the bonds in sunder or break them off is what that means. And then our, our lesson goes down to verse 15. It says, Behold, the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good news. Good tidings, rather. Good, good news is what tidings are. That publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast. Perform thy vows. For the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. He says, he says here, Behold, upon the mountain are the feet of him that bring of good news. The good news is that Assyria has been taken out, has been torn down. The, the, the Assyrians, the people of Nineveh, they can't harm you anymore. They're not there anymore. That's why they can't, uh, I, I, I won't afflict you using these guys anymore because I've taken them out, taken them out completely. I'm going to destroy them is what this is because this is a prophecy Behold upon the mountain of the feet of him that bring the good news, the glad tidings. And, and the, the good news, Isaiah talked about the person, the feet of the person bringing the, the good news and the, the glad tidings. And Paul did too, also in Romans, the 10th chapter. Verse 13 said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14 says, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not believed? heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent 
Sent for it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The person that is preaching the gospel of peace is telling someone about Jesus Christ. Though that Those are awesome words for someone to hear, but they have to hear. That preacher has to be sent to them. And when that preacher is sent to them, they hear the words that the preacher say to them. And when they hear the word, they believe that word that they have heard. And after they believe that word, then they're saved. You take those, those verses in reverse and you understand the progression of how things work when a person hears that good news, that glad tidings, when those beautiful feet begin to preach that, it might be corns on that feet, on, on the feet, maybe have bunions and, and things, but still they're beautiful because of the message that is being brought by the person that's bringing that message to them. It, uh, bringing good tidings and publishes peace. Oh, Judah, oh, people of Judah, keep thy solemn feast, those, the celebrations that you have. Keep those things, those things that were put in the Mosaic law at this time. Keep those things and perform the vows, the rituals that you're supposed to do according to the Mosaic law. For the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off, completely destroyed, completely. Justice and salvation and liberation are deliverance. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we do pray that this word will simmer on our hearts and minds and help us to understand that you are fair, you are right, and you will deliver. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.